Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. The show covering all things health, wellness, culture, and more. The show for all of us who aren't old, we're better. Each week, we'll interview superstars, experts, and ordinary people doing extraordinary things, all related to this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Now, here's your host, the award-winning Paul Vogelzang. Welcome to the Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. I'm Paul Vogelzang, and today we're embarking on a magical journey into one of the most beloved fairy tales of all time, Beauty and the Beast. Joining us are folklore specialist and educator, Smithsonian Associates, Sarah Cleto and Brittany Mormon. They're returning guests, they're audience favorites. I'm looking forward to talking to them again. They're gonna help us peel back the layers of this rich narrative to uncover the profound impact that Beauty and the Beast has had across cultures and epochs. So. Smithsonian Associates Sarah Cleto and Brittany Warman will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up. So please check out our website for dates and more details on their upcoming presentation titled Beauty and the Beast, a tale as old as time. Beauty and the Beast is a tale as old as time. It weaves themes of love, transformation and the true essence of beauty into its narrative fabric. But beyond its romantic veneer, the story offers deep insights into the societal and personal dynamics of its time. Today, Smithsonian Associates Sarah Cleto and Brittany Warman of the Carter Haas School of Folklore and the Fantastic will join us to explore how beauty and the beast challenges our perceptions of relationships and individual metamorphosis through its complex characters and intricate plot developments. You're going to just love this conversation. I always enjoy talking to Brittany and Sarah. From its earliest iterations in folklore to its modern day incarnations in film and literature, Beauty and the Beast has captivated audiences around the globe. We will learn from Sarah and Brittany today about some of these different cultures and how they've interpreted and adapted the tale, reflecting their own unique societal norms and values. Brittany and Sarah will also discuss the story's relevance in contemporary society, how it addresses current issues and continues continues to inspire and provoke thought among new generations. So stay tuned as we uncover the mysteries of this enchanting tale with the insightful guidance of Smithsonian Associates Sarah Cleto and Brittany Warman. As I say, they are returning guests. We're going to discover why Beauty and the Beast remains a favorite story for many transcending time and culture. Sarah Cleto, Brittany Warman, Smithsonian Associates, both of you, welcome back to the program. Thank you so so much much. for having us again. We're delighted to be back and chatting with you. I am so excited to talk to you about our subject today, Beauty and the Beast. I know it's a favorite of yours. And Sarah, you'll just have to jump right in and correct me at at (laughs) any because I know you're an expert, Brittany, you too. But let's talk about your upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation, particularly when it comes to Beauty and the Beast, how you'll use Zoom to engage us, because I know we're all on Zoom these days and I know our audience is excited about this subject. I am too. So let's just jump right in. Well, we're really thrilled to be able to do this new series of deep dives for the Smithsonian Associates into individual fairy tale families instead of trying to cover all of the fairy tales, all of the fairy tales. tales. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, it's been really fun getting to zoom in and do a spotlight on one at a time because it really means we get to talk about it in a lot more depth. And we are thrilled to have the chance to do this with Beauty and the Beast, which is My personal favorite fairy tale was actually the subject of my MA thesis, and I used it a lot in my dissertation too, but for my MA, it was all Beauty and the Beast all the time. I got to read (laughs) not all of them. There are literally thousands of versions of this particular fairy tale, but at least hundreds. And we're so excited to share that with the audience. We have some questions that we have sprinkled throughout the presentation to engage with people a little bit, like have some interactive polls and get some feedback in real time, which is something that we've only started doing with the Smithsonian Associates pretty recently. But we've really enjoyed. We always love hearing from people 
in real time. So we like having that bit of interaction in there instead of us just talking at them for an hour and a half. So we're really looking forward to that. Yeah, this is a new format for the Smithsonian Associates talks. Mm -hmm. And we've really been having a fun time with it. We love most of the talks that we do are very interactive. We usually have like a chat going that we can see which isn't really the case with the Smithsonian talks, but this way we get to ask questions and have people respond. And sometimes the answers are really interesting. Like what we usually ask, like what version of a fairy tale they are most familiar with, for example. And sometimes the answers there are really exciting. And we expect to hear things like Disney, but sometimes people have all different kinds of experiences with these stories. Yeah, sometimes it's really obscure things. Sometimes it's a childhood picture book that Brittany and I might also have encountered. And it's just fun to compare notes. And here are some really unexpected things sometimes. We'll compare some notes right now for us. Tell us a little bit about the variations, because there are many. And I grew up with one. I probably am. I fall into the probably the Disney category of Beauty and the Beast. But I know both of you know many, many more and others. (laughs) You're always so popular on our program with our audience. And as I say, this particular presentation about Beauty and the Beast will be very intriguing. So maybe tell us about some of these versions. We would love to. So first, there was like, I've been trying for this. I've been waiting for this all my life. Um, First, I will say that the Disney animated version is fantastic. I mean, you know, Brittany and I always, we, we love sharing versions beyond Disney. Like there's so much more to fairy tales beyond Disney. But Disney can do really spectacular work. And the Disney animated Beauty and the Beast is, in my opinion, a masterpiece. You've experienced something really good there. But one of the really cool things about Beauty and the Beast and why it's so much fun to study and dive into is that it is one of the fairy tales that we know extends really far back into history. It's a really, really, really old one. And there are so many different patterns to how this story can unfold. For example, one of the oldest written down versions, literary versions that we have is the the Greek myth about Eros and Psyche. And it has a little bit of a different pattern than Beauty and the Beast as we generally know it today, but it's still within the same story family. So reaching back all the way to Greek myth is really, really fun. That's a, a great version to look at. You know, we have gods and goddesses running around, but it's still very recognizably the same story structure in a lot of ways. And there are a couple different big families or categories of Beauty and the Beast within this bigger umbrella. One of them, which includes Eros and Psyche, involves the beauty character going out on this epic quest. Actually, the whole category taken collectively, folklorists call Search for the Lost Husband. And that's really highlighted in this one particular subgroup where all of these beauties go out and they have to find their husband and do this really active adventure in a way that a lot of people don't associate with popular fairy tales. They think that the heroines tend to be really passive. But even in a lot of these really old Beauty and the Beast type stories, we have these heroines who are going out and doing these journeys and uh, fulfilling impossible quests and tasks and I really like that part of this fairy tale's history, that there's this substantial category of stories within it where the beauties, they're kind of kicking butt. It's really fun. (laughs) I was just going to add that one thing about Beauty and the Beast story that's really interesting is that in later times, we really focused on the category of these tales that is just the beauty and the beast character getting to know each other and then cutting out the beauty adventure part. But there are so many of those subtypes of the story in history throughout the history of this particular tale type. And it's really exciting to see people rediscover that part of this story and realize how well it fits with the other part of the story about the getting to know each other, falling in love with a beastly prince character and then having to fight for that character in addition to that is also a really cool aspect of this story that we are really excited to talk to people about and show oh there's this whole other part of this story that often we don't really talk about anymore it's just fascinating to me i think as i've come to know you both and your work i have always been amazed at the breadth the just the sheer number of versions and how this all has some cultural significance and and it's endured probably because of that. Maybe tell us a little bit about how it's evolved across across different 
cultures to make it relevant and timely for all of us? Sure. This fairy tale, Beauty and the Beast, is obviously one of the more popular, one of the more famous fairy tales that most people tend to know about. Most people could tell you the basic plot pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I do think that is because it has the ability to be incredibly resonant with all kinds of different people in so many different cultural contexts over an epic amount of time. Part of this is because Beauty and the Beast is one of the very few canonical fairy tales, one of the very few major fairy tales that really delves into the experience of developing romantic love. And that might sound kind of unbelievable. I know a lot of people, when they think about fairy tales, they automatically think romance, marriage, mm -hmm. relationships, but the fairy tale weddings, actually, fairy tale weddings, yes. Mm -hmm. But that's usually not the point of most really famous fairy tales. Often the relationships that are being explored are familial. I mean, think about something like Cinderella, which is all about the conflict within Cinderella's family of origin with her stepmother and stepsisters, or Snow White, which is all about the conflict between a mother and a daughter. And we could go on, but. Right. And sure, those the stories beast. have weddings in them, but the wedding isn't the point of the story. The romantic love is tacked on to the end, really. Yeah, it's sort of incidental or is kind of like an escape hatch or just a way of resetting the status quo. But in Beauty and the Beast, it's literally the point. Like the point of this story is forming a romantic relationship or further back uh, in older versions of the story is not even necessarily romantic, but marriage, some kind of partnership. And over time and in different cultures, what this fairy tale has meant has changed radically. It's meant so many different things. And sometimes it's been used to like reconcile yourself to marriage if you aren't excited about it. <laughs> it can be, to put it as like a mild understatement there, it can be a way of passing along wisdom or warnings about the danger of marriage. And a lot of really old Beauty and the Beast stories, the Beast is Gary. One of the other really big categories of this fairy tale, you know, we mentioned the questing beauties. Another big category focuses much more on the Beast and what happened to him, how he got cursed or monstrous or weird and follows him more than the beauty character, which is what we're more used to. So in a lot of those versions that focus on the beast, we hear a lot about the ways in which he is monstrous. Sometimes he's killed a bunch of his previous wives, like in an Italian version called the Pig King. Hmm. He literally murders his first two wives. So in that version, it's much more like examining the dangers of marriage, trying to like strategize for how to survive. And later on, it became much more a story about advocating for a companionate marriage where you actually like the other person. <laughs> and we get really started them. seeing, yeah, get to know them. And we saw that turn really in the 1700s with a couple different French versions, but culminating in the version by Madame Beaumont, who wrote the version that... Disney pulled from a lot that Cocteau pulled from a lot for his 19, I want to say 45, iconic black and white film of Beauty and the Beast that also heavily impacted the Disney version. This is a very long winded way of saying that this is a fairy tale that's been around for a long time, hundreds, arguably thousands of years that has always been there to hold the shape of a romantic relationship and figure out how do you reconcile to this? How do you design a marriage that you like? How do you get to know a partner who might seem scary or difficult to wrap your head around? It's a space to work through all of those different feelings, anxieties, excitement. It can hold all of those different things depending on the version. And I think it's really important to remember, too, that for a lot of the women, especially in Beaumont's time, these were marriages that liking your partner, loving your partner was definitely not a prerequisite to marriage. Yeah, that was not all. the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was not the point of marriage. And a story that argued that maybe that should be the point of marriage, maybe getting to know your partner, liking your partner, being able to sit at a dinner table and chat with your partner about various things is important to marriage and should be considered as part of what marriage means. That was kind of radical for the time period. And 
the switch to that, the argument for that through this fairy tale is definitely not something we should underestimate culturally. But I think it's really easy to read these old French versions, to read Beaumont's version now and be like, well, this doesn't feel revolutionary or radical. The skill's kind of uptight and very didactic. Hmm. But it's important to know for the context at the time, just saying like, no, actually, you should get to have an opinion. You should be able to choose to say yes or no. You have the right to like the person that you're going to marry. At the time, that was a really big deal. That was not something that was culturally taken for granted in the way that's the bedrock now of how we tend to approach romantic relationships. At the time, it was pretty radical. It almost offers a feminist perspective. And I think that that's always a plus, I think, as we in any yeah. relationship. It's a, yeah. And so maybe tell, tell us a little bit about this aspect of empowering and what it means to that injected into these stories, because I think it's a very important element. With this fairy tale, I, I think there's this tendency nowadays, you hear people complaining about Beauty and the Beast a lot. People are always complaining about fairy tales in, in feminist contexts without really looking very deeply at what these tales are actually saying. And with Beauty and the Beast, you get a lot of Stockholm Syndrome comments on the internet, people saying that Beauty is put in this horrible situation and falls in love with her captor and how awful is that, how anti-feminist that is. When in reality, this story over the years has meant something very different to people. Like we were saying, especially in the French context and when the story as we know it most now, the one that Cocteau and Disney used for their Beauty and the Beast stories, those stories were really radical because they centered the female perspective and said there are circumstances where being put in this marriage, you don't have any control over that in the society where these stories came from, but there are opportunities there and ways to possibly express yourself, express your wants and desires get to know your partner, work with your partner, have a say in the things that go on in your life. One of the most amazing things about the traditional Beauty and the Beast Beaumont story to me is that the Beast every night for a very long period of time asks Beauty to marry him because that will break his curse. They mm -hmm. can't say that part. And Beauty says no. Beauty has the opportunity to say no in that situation. Over and over and over. Over and over again. And the fact that she does that, that she has that boundary, that she has the strength to say that. I mean, even just that small thing in the world of this fairy tale, when, it, when this fairy tale came about in the form that we know it now, is pretty amazing. And I think that that is something that people tend to overlook now when they look at this story through a feminist lens. And context is everything in folklore. And I think that there's something really powerful about this story that often gets overlooked. I completely agree. And I will add that not every version of Beauty and the Beast is feminist. There are plenty. Oh, sure. Yeah, that that's are, what I kept saying. The that Beaumont are... <laughs> version, the Beaumont version. Yeah. But mm -hmm. like, yeah, they're definitely... Yeah versions that are not so great on this front. The Pig King comes and to mind for sure. It's also completely valid for someone to read Beaumont and be like, mm, but she's still locked up with him in his castle and she can't leave. <laughs> Is that feminist? No. Probably like, not. No. Said, not, you know, not as we think about it anyway. Not as we think about it now. But again, context is so important for understanding what fairy tales have meant historically and what they they can mean now and for the evolution of the story. So even though you can look at something like Beaumont's version and come to many different completely reasonable conclusions about what it says about gender, what it says about power or agency, the fact that those possibilities are there and that they existed in that story in I think it was 1756-ish when it was first published. That's pretty cool. You know, that's that's worth keeping in mind. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Paul. Do you love entertaining, informative, eclectic, insightful programs about culture, health, science, life? 
and everything Smithsonian. As part of our Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast, we're introducing you to the new Smithsonian Associates streaming series. Smithsonian, a nonprofit organization, is excited to present this new aspect of their 55 years as the world's largest museum-based educational program. Join us from the comfort of your home as we periodically interview Smithsonian Associate guest speakers. Our audience here on radio and podcast can explore our website for more information, links, and details at notold-better.com. Thanks, everybody. Our guests today are Smithsonian Associates, Sarah Clito and Brittany Warman. Both Sarah and Brittany are previous guests on the program, and they are folklorists. Their upcoming presentation about beauty and the beast can be found in our show notes today. For more information, please check it out. You can find out all about Brittany and Sarah and their work at the Carter Haas School of Folklore. It's such a joy to talk to you both again. I really love this subject, talking about all of these amazing, often overlooked aspects. You mentioned feminism, and we talked about this idea of boundaries. There's lots of subjects about values and moralities and all of these wonderful fairy tales, and Beauty and the Beast is a favorite. I wonder if you have a favorite adaptation, both of you, of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, Sarah, I'm sure with all of your work and research, <laughs> You're likely to, Brittany, you too, but maybe tell us a little bit about what it is that caught your attention about the individual interpretation of Beauty and the Beast that you like so much. There's so many good ones out there. There really are. There are a lot of not so great ones out there, but there are a lot of really great ones out there too. One of my personal favorites is a very weird one. It's definitely not everyone's cup of tea, but it is a lovely and bizarre little novel called Sunshine by Robin McKinley. And that story just delights me to no end. The beast character is a vampire and the beauty character is a baker. I will add an aside that most vampire stories, at least contemporary vampire stories, are playing with a lot of themes from Beauty and the Beast. And there's the, the monster and the usually girl, but depends on the version of the story that can't resist them. So you can keep that filed away for mm -hmm. any vampire stories you encounter. I love this weird version. So much space is created for the beauty character to sort of self-actualize. There's a lot mm -hmm. of time devoted to her figuring out who she is. There's a lot of space given to how these two characters can work together there without getting like super bogged down in the details. They are diametrically opposed in a lot of really, really fundamental ways, but their survival depends on them learning how to work together. And I really enjoy the delicate negotiation of it hmm. in this particular version. Early on, the beauty character tells the beast character a version of Beauty and the Beast as a storytelling thing. So I enjoy that intertextuality. And also there's a lot of dessert in that version because the beauty character is a baker. And I always, I'm very, very hungry yeah, hello. <laughs> by, the, by the end of that book, but it's a lot of fun. That's probably my favorite. That sounds yeah. like, well, it'll be my favorite too. I think I've told both of you, my wife and I have two boys. One is a baker. So I make sure to oh, catch me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, what do you think? Sarah mentioned Sunshine by Robin McKinley. Robin McKinley actually has a bunch of different retellings of Beauty and the Beast that are all it really, does. really fun. The one that I always go back to is actually, I think, the first novel length fairy tale retelling that I ever came across was her more straightforward Beauty and the Beast retelling called Beauty. I found it in the library. It was the first novel length retelling of a fairy tale I'd ever come across. And it was so good. She expanded the story in this beautiful way and added all these wonderful details. And I was just utterly enchanted. I credit it with sending me on my journey to find more <laughs> fairy tale retellings mm, because I was great. so delighted with this one. So I will say that she did. That one was Beauty. There's another one called Rose Daughter. There's another one called Chalice. Sarah has written extensively about all these different because <laughs> Robin McKinley is, is definitely fascinated with this story and loves to come back to it. I will also say we mentioned the cocteau black and white Beauty and the Beast that was very inspirational for the Disney version. It's also just a fascinating film in a lot of it's ways. It's so cool. It's huh. just really cool, especially for an older film. It has this quality of magic to it, like real deep 
scary but enchanting magic to it that is just amazing to watch. There are little details like the candelabras coming out of the walls are hands that move and everything about it is just strange and wonderful. And so if you haven't seen that version, I definitely recommend you check that one out. I love that one too. And just to plug a couple more that we both really love. Juliet Marillier has a gorgeous novel called Heart's Blood that is a medieval retelling of Beauty and the Beast set in Ireland, in which the beauty character is a scribe and the beast character is a local leader. I think the word that she uses is chieftain. That's really, really cool and does a really actually good portrayal of disability. The beast is disabled in that one. And he's allowed to just be a person with a disability without the story being about how he needs to be cured of it. He just gets to be a romantic lead who gets to have a romance and get and has a disability, which is incredibly rare still, which is infuriating. But that's one of the reasons that I love that version so much. Also, it's just beautiful. And Juliet is a gorgeous, gorgeous writer. A couple other really good ones are The Tiger's Bride by Angela Carter and also The Courtship of Mr. Lion are her two Beauty and the Beast retellings in her collection of fairy tales, The Bloody Chamber. They're very, very different tonally, but they're both really, really fascinating. The Tiger's Bride will um, stay with me forever. I swear forever. the ending is is so phenomenal. Yeah, it was another one that was completely revolutionary for its time. It came out in, I think, 1979 or so. Mm-hmm. And it changed the way that I think fairy tales were retold forever. So we're not going to ruin it for you guys. But if you <laughs> haven't read it, uh, definitely check that one out. I want to go check the Cocteau version out too. I love black and white. It's such a beautiful way to tell a story and filmmakers can do that in really imaginative ways. I wonder in your research, both of you, are there any aspects of Beauty and the Beast that still require some further exploration as folklorists? Or what do you both see in terms of the additional study that can come about as a result of this particular fairy tale, Beauty and the Beast? Oh, that's such a good question. One of the things that comes to mind is something that Sarah mentioned about Heart's Blood. The portrayal of disability in that book is really good, but there are a lot of versions of Beauty and the Beast that unfortunately portray the beast as disabled in some way that are not Mm. very good. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely like to see more exploration in that area, both in traditional stories and retellings, how people negotiate the concept of disability within the world of this story, for sure. One of the places that Beauty and the Beast stories can really stumble or really shine is the fact that the beast is often, he's othered in some way. He is different. He is Mm -hmm. perceived as monstrous. And the thing that makes him monstrous, you can imagine how that fill in the blank has worked over time. How sometimes there's been a stand in for being from another place or being another race or being disabled or any other sort of outsider or marginalized identity. So sometimes those stories can be Really, really frustrating, but sometimes they can be done so beautifully and with a lot of compassion and a lot of humanity. And I look forward to seeing more versions in the future that embrace our collective humanity. Trying to figure out a way to explore these stories and this concept of the other without resorting to shorthand that is problematic in today's world and was always problematic, really. But Things like race, things like disability as being like, oh, this makes this person other and beastly in some Mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Trying to find another way to do that and a way to speak to this, the beastliness of the beast in a way that does not center those kinds of things. Yeah, that isn't dehumanizing. Exactly. Sarah Clito, Brittany Warman, Smithsonian Associates, Folklorists have been our guest today. They're returning guests to the program. It is always such a pleasure to talk to you. You both have such a wonderful way of explaining these things and they're deep. They're always very deep. I learned so much. I know our audience will. Thank you for your generosity for coming back on the program. I think this upcoming presentation at Smithsonian Associates about Beauty and the Beast will be fascinating. We'll have links 
so that our audience can find out more about Sarah Clito, Brittany Warman, their work with Smithsonian Associates, as well as their work at the Carter Haas School of Folklore and the Fantastic. We'll also put links for the cocktail version of the Beauty and the Beast show <laughs> movie, as well as everything else that Sarah and Brittany have mentioned today. But Sarah, Brittany, thanks for your time. I look forward to talking to you again. It's just always such a joy and I learned so much. So thank you. Thank you so much. We always love chatting with you. So thank you for having us back. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Smithsonian Associates, Sarah Clito and Brittany Warman will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up. My thanks to them, but please check out our website for more dates and details about Brittany and Sarah at Smithsonian Associates presenting Beauty and the Beast, a tale as old as time. You can find links and lots of information in our show notes today. My thanks to Smithsonian Associates for all they do to support the show. My thanks, of course, always to executive producer Sam Hanniger, who designs our excellent sound and so much more. My thanks to you, my dear Not Old Better Show audience, for your company today. I hope You'll join me next time, but be safe, be healthy, and let's talk about better. The Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us this week on the Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. To find out more about all of today's stories or to view our extensive back catalog of previous shows, simply visit notold-better.com. Join us again next time as we deep dive into some of the most fascinating real-life stories from across the world, all focused on this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Let's talk about better. The Not Old Better Show. I would find all thing. Please check out our website for this episode and all episodes at notold-better.com or subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out your local radio stations to find out more about the Not Old Better Show on podcast and radio radio you can find us all over social media our twitter feed is not old better and we're on instagram at not old better too the not old better show is a production of nobs studios i'm paul vogel saying and i hope you'll join me again next time to talk about better the not old better show thanks everybody we'll see you next week